Welcome everyone to Dental CE Academy. My name is Dr. Kirsten Rowling and I'm excited about this evening's presentation and our uh, featured guest speaker, as I call her, Amanda Hill. Um, so I'm not gonna be lonely here behind the screen anymore. It'll be Amanda and I tag teaming this this evening. This is the top 10 essential infection control strategies for improved safety in the dental practice. And this is sort of a culmination of teaching infection control for, I was trying to add up the years, dare I say close to 30 years I've been teaching infection control. And I realized it took me about 30 years to figure out that a lot of the questions were the same. So why not put a course together where we're identifying maybe where some of our deficiencies are or where we need a little bit more knowledge. So I've developed these 10 top strategies. Now, you may think of something later on, send it to me. It could be the top 11. It could be the top 15. If I don't cover it, we'll take a look at it. And thanks everyone for being here this evening. Again, if you've just joined us, you'll need the handout. It was sent a little while ago, but you can access that by tapping on the red banner at the top of the screen or taking a look at those instructions we have for you in the chat area. I do wanna thank Dove Dental Products for supporting our efforts to improve infection control and dental practice safety. And there's our conflict of interest and financial disclosure for you all. Our agenda is five to six for the CE webinar. Following the webinar, there will be a promotional webinar that Amanda will be presenting about Dove Dental Products. And I encourage you to stay on for it because you're going to be queued up. You're going to want to know where to get these products. All right, and uh, Bob Vanderselt with Dove, they're offering free samples as well. So you'll need to stay on to get those free samples. I'll be presenting strategies one through eight. Amanda is presenting strategies nine through 10, surprise on water and suction. So um, I am super excited to have her here because she is what I believe the expert in the industry right now. Following the CE class, we are going to redirect you all to take a quiz to complete for CE credit. And you'll also be sent a reminder email, okay? So just for interest here is Amanda's bio. Um, she's an enthusiastic speaker. She's an innovative consultant. I think we're like minds when it comes to infection control, Amanda, and an award-winning author. And she's really um, someone who has spent quite a bit of time and resource and education learning about uh, various infection control protocols and postgraduate education. And I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to tell you that you're in for a big treat. So hold on to your seat because we are going to give you a lot of information this evening. Um, there is my bio and yes, in my spare time, I'm a basketball wife and we have a nonprofit um, Henry Bibby Star Athletes and that's me in the back row, the short person. And that's my husband, coach Henry Bibby in the back and we present basketball camps to at-risk youth. Um, aside from that, I am a public health dentist, a uh, passionate public health dentist, and I began my foray in dentistry as a registered dental assistant in 1981 before we used PPE. And let's go ahead and get on with it now. Learning objectives are in your handout. We've got top 10 strategies today, aerosol, surface disinfection, hand hygiene, PPE, sterilization, pre-procedural rinses, nasal decolonization. You're gonna say, what? Uh, hand pieces, water lines, um, and I've got hand pieces there twice. I should have had suction, sorry about that, Amanda. Um, we're gonna talk now about aerosol. Okay, the problem here, spatter droplets, droplet nuclei, ultra fine particles embed preferentially in the respiratory tract. The smaller the particles are, the deeper they embed potentially into the respiratory tract. And this is a, a source of dental practice contamination as well. It can be a source of antimicrobial resistance because if this aerosol, this contamination um, is allowed to settle on our surfaces for any length of time, um, that gives the playground for these pathogens to mutate and possibly become antimicrobial resistant. Water lines and hand pieces, as you'll hear Amanda talk about here, are also a source of aerosol. 
When we talk about aerosol, we talk about treating zones. Um, I say the zone closest to the patient's face, where our face is. Um, the operatory itself, four uh, meters, could be six meters or more. And then we have to look at our entire facility. Some practices don't even have HVAC, right? Air quality monitoring is important. There are technology um, available for you that can actually help you monitor the air quality in and outside of your dental practice. Uh, we need to look at effectively disinfecting surfaces. Of course, water line testing and treatment, which Amanda is going to address. Handpiece maintenance and sterilization. If you have hand pieces that are not sterilized properly, you are going to create contaminated aerosol. Uh, nitrous oxide monitoring badges, which you may have not thought of, but if you are a woman of childbearing years, it's good to look into getting these monitoring badges. And if you go to the American Dental Association's website, you will see a link for that. And then of course, we'll talk about pre-procedural rinses and nasal decolonization as it relates to aerosol and beyond. And the science behind aerosol, again, the large particles tend to deposit mainly in the upper airway. Um, the particles that are two to five microns will deposit in the central and the small airways. And these ultra fine particles, they deposit very deep in the alveolar region. So again, this is a cumulative situation for us too. We're embedded in aerosol in our practices. We offer you a free resource here, and that is a course that I present, I think, once a month live. So take advantage of that link. It's, it's also available on demand. If you have any questions as well, please type them in the chat area because Amanda and I will tag team these questions uh, towards the end of our presentation. All right, surfaces. Contamination left on environmental surfaces can lead to dissemination of disease transmission. So we wanna be able to tackle that contamination while it occurs. We don't want it staying on our surfaces. It also contributes to aerosol contamination. So these pathogens that land on our surfaces can become re-aerosolized and pathogenic spores. We know Clostridium difficile can live for many months. It's thought to even be years. Um, in our dental practices. And unfortunately, the wipes that we use, quaternary ammonium compounds, are not sporicidal. They will not kill Clostridium difficile spores, and they are quite toxic. Strategies here, we can use hypochlorous acid, which is non-toxic, versus the quaternary ammonium compounds. We can use hypochlorous acid on all environmental surfaces but the hypochlorous acid should be labeled EPA list K registered. So if you leave this program today and you go to Amazon and you purchase the first hypochlorous acid off of Amazon and it's happened, it may not be on EPA list K. It may be too acidic. The concentration may not be correct. Um, now, hypochlorous acid, you can purchase dry wipes and use those dry wipes with the HSCL on your high touch areas and follow that by using an electrostatic sprayer in your operatories and really anywhere in your practice, your labs, your front office, um, the reception area. And the electrostatic sprayer will create a wraparound effect and it will help you reach 30% more surface area in a lot less time. You can turn over your dental operatories in four minutes. Okay, I'm going to show you a quick video here of why I believe we need to be using um, hypochlorous acid and especially anything on EPA list K that is going to kill C. difficile spores and everything else. So these are six experts from Contagion. Uh, Dr. Paul Fjordstad is an international expert on Clostridium difficile. He is a uh, gastroenterologist involved in quite a bit of research. We have some infectious diseases experts here, and they're going to tell you how Clostridium difficile is transmitted. Um, we know about the carrier model, but they're going to tell you that what we really need to be concerned about now is the contamination in outpatient settings, which is on the rise, and they're going to call out dental practices.
So let's talk about community C. diff if we could for a moment. Uh, uh, what are the risk factors in, in the community and how do they differ in the community versus the, the hospital-based uh, population here? Dale, you wanna start us on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good uh, question because um, there's two factors that we need to have in order to get C. diff. One is antibiotic use and the other is uh, exposure to the spores. So the spores are ubiquitous. They're out in the environment. They even contaminate at a very low level some foods, meats, uh, root vegetables, lettuce. And those are probably how patients in the community get exposed. They, um, on the other hand, uh, when the CDC has looked at community associated C. diff, they found that about 80% of these patients have had an exposure to healthcare as an outpatient. So it's doctor's office, dental office, and uh, you know, chronic dialysis units, uh, ambulatory surgery. And this is where you have two risks. One is that somebody's going to give you an antibiotic and that those are called doctors. And, uh, <laughs> and we they, hope it's only they, they, they put people <laughs> at risk of C. diff. And, uh, and the other exposure is that the healthcare environment is more contaminated with C. diff spores than is the environment outside of healthcare. And I, I think it's worth noting, Paul, Paul is nodding his head, you had a lot of nodding. <laughs> uh, it's not just the people who are in the healthcare system. It's not just the people who got the antibiotics. They go home, they've got spores, and then their families are exposed. So uh, it seems to me that that's, that's part of the, the issue, isn't it? And those, yeah, spores, yes. those spores can live for a significant period of time on many different surfaces, even when exposed to sunlight. And you know, you'll see some data that says, alcohol and certain um, certain products can kill the spores, but that, it really has to be used properly where they where the, the liquid sits on a surface for a significant period of time to have its effects. So the fact that the spores can be taken home with you on your lab coat and, and in your house and on your on surfaces for six months or a year or longer uh, certainly put people at risk. Okay, for those of you, there are a handful of you that may not have heard the video on your device. It may be a conflict with your browser because this runs on Chrome. So if you have Zoom or something running in the background, but all the video links are here for you. And that was the first link. So we include the science here for you. Um, clinicians report how to choose and use environmental disinfectants. And you'll see that Dr. Rella Christensen believes that quaternary ammonium compounds are ineffective. And she's going to give you um, her evidence of that. Um, we've included a couple other, couple other citations for you. This was a July um, publication, uh, Chemical Class of Emerging Concern, QACs, which were found to be toxic. Um, regulation, it's not well regulated, not um, oversight, not what it should be. Concerns about fertility, immunity, and so forth. And then this link at the very bottom is a demo of using hypochlorous acid with an electrostatic sprayer. So um, take advantage of those links. And we have some free resources for you, some more classes. I present a class on hypochlorous acid, um, surface decontamination, and Clostridium difficile, my favorite sort of after surviving Clostridium difficile myself last year that followed a dental procedure and antibiotics. Um, Brittany wants to know, you might cover this, but will washing the lab coat with normal laundry detergent kill the seed with spores? And you're a little ahead of it, but I'm gonna give the spoiler alert, no. So lab coats would have to be washed in bleach and hot water. And there's some evidence to suggest that even uh, bleach is not as effective on C. difficile spores anymore. All right, hands here. We are moving along, Amanda. So the problem here, hands are the number one mode of trans disease transmission in the healthcare setting. Um, when we don't wash our hands, we're putting ourselves at risk, we're putting our team members at risk, we're putting our patients at risk, and we're putting our family members at home risk because, or at risk at home, because these pathogens follow you home. Clostridium difficile can follow you home. And that's not fear mongering. It's the absolute truth, right? So wash your hands frequently during the day. 
I'm going to show you, and especially when you put your gloves on before putting your gloves on and taking your gloves off because gloves complicate the situation. These pathogens that are on your hands will multiply and divide very rapidly under those dark, damp gloves. So if you take your gloves off and you reach for your phone or you reach for a keyboard, that is cross-contamination. Um, the problem also is that many of us are using bulk refillable soap dispensers or these disposable containers that are meant to be thrown away. Refilling them or not may increase hand contamination as we'll see. And hand hygiene really needs to be a cultural practice in your dental practice or clinic. If your team doesn't see the doctors washing their hands, chances are they probably aren't either. And your patients are watching you. If you go into Yelp, and the Google reviews are going to hear, my dentist didn't wash their hands, my assistant didn't wash their hands, and so forth. So again, hands are the number one mode of transmission in the chain of infection. And the idea here is that we want to disrupt one or more of these chains. And that's the first question on your quiz this evening, by the way. So again, if you don't wash your hands, you're just leading to um, possibility of cross-contamination and, and uh, disease transmission. So strategies here, implement a hand hygiene routine. And there is a link here that I'm going to show you that's very quick, 20 to 30 second routine that you can memorize. It's going to cover all surfaces of your hand. Um, question of soap and water versus alcohol hand sanitizer. The CDC recommends alcohol-based hand sanitizer because they know that it increases compliance. And there are some of us that are practicing in areas where we don't have sinks. I've been up on a stage in a cafeteria, I've been in a broom closet um, and so forth. So um, replacing bulk refillable soap dispensers or your disposable throwaways, which are at risk for contamination with biofilm. I'm gonna show you a very quick video here just so that we can um, emphasize why we wanna to go to really a hands-free system when we wash our hands. You're most likely to come in contact with fecal bacteria with a refillable soap dispenser than anywhere in a public restroom. Because you really can't tell contamination's occurring. You can't see the bacteria growing in there. So you never really know if there's bacteria or not. That's why using a, a sealed uh, soap dispenser is the way to go. Well, it's been found that really cleaning a regular refillable soap dispensers uh, doesn't really get at the bacterial problem because biofilms develop inside these soap dispensers. And even if you clean them and disinfect them, it comes back right away, the bacteria. As soon as you put uh, additional soap in these dispensers, the bacteria start growing right away. Well, I think there's a, definitely a risk to people getting ill from refillable soap dispensers because you find bacteria in there that can cause eye, skin infections, and wound infections. So I think the probability is there. And it, of course, it's been demonstrated in healthcare facilities. So we know the, the potential is really strong for this to occur. You know, people are going in there to remove things from their hands and they're putting them on. Uh, they're trying to take off fecal bacteria by washing their hands, and they're actually putting them on. So in a way, it, it, it's an oxymoron. You're, you're doing the reverse of why you're washing your hands. Well, I really think uh, bulk soaps dispensers should be regulated. Uh, and, and in fact, I don't even think they should be used. I think we really should go to uh, sanitary seal soap dispensers that you, you can't refill all the time, because that would eliminate the problem of the growth of the bacteria in these dispensers. But I think it's really the responsibility of facility management is to put the proper type of soap in these facilities so people don't increase their exposure to large numbers of bacteria. The greatest exposure to fecal bacteria for many people may be washing their hands.
that, by the way, is not a commercial for Gojo, but it's the only great video that I have been able to find that really demonstrates. And I've tried contacting them. Um, there is a course that I present on effective hand hygiene and it's one CE. So for a deeper dive, um, be sure to register for that class. And there's a breakdown for the benefits in comparison of hand washing with soap and water versus alcohol-based hand rub. And alcohol-based hand rub is not sporicidal. It will not kill C. difficile spores, but in many settings, that's your best alternative. Um, and if you're using either one of these, I would stop using those because we I think we've demonstrated they're not safe and go to a touchless system. And these systems are actually very cost effective. And you want to use a system to where your hands don't touch anything when you wash them. Um, we don't want to reapply germs during the process. All right, we're going to move on to PPE here. And I look like I'm running pretty well with time here. So PPE, the problem here, as clinicians were exposed to direct and indirect contamination all day long, dentistry is procedural and PPE is an intervention, right? It's an intervention in that chain of infection. We wanna prevent disease transmission when we come into direct contact with patients or indirect contact with contaminated instruments or surfaces or aerosol. Uh, disposable gowns, one of my real concerns here is the number of those out there practicing with your forearms exposed because I know you're not washing your hands up to here. And so if you're going from patient to patient or you're going to the lunchroom to eat, um, you really wanna be wearing either a disposable gown or a laundered gown and cover your forearms. And we've got a, a photo here for you. The CDC says to replace that gown at least once daily or when it's soiled. I myself, it depends on the amount of aerosol I'm uh, being exposed to if I am running hygiene all day, I might want to change this gown more often. Now, I've had hygienists that have reached out recently that said that they've been told to reuse their gowns for a couple of days and spray them with Lysol. I don't think that's a good strategy. Um, it's not a good strategy for you and it's not a good strategy for your patient. Shoe covers, I think, are essential because when we look at studies, we see that we can take these pathogens home with us into our vehicles, to our homes, uh, childcare, and so forth. So shoe covers are uh, a great idea or change your shoes when you arrive in the office and change back into your street shoes when you go home. Head covers, I'm a firm believer. I don't want all that aerosol in my hair and it doesn't stay in your hair. I'm gonna carry it to another uh, operatory and so forth, as well as face shields and laundry. If you are laundering your own scrubs, be sure to keep your laundry separate from your household laundry and use Lysol laundry sanitizer. Again, not an endorsement, but a product that with hot water can help uh, mitigate for about 99.9% .9 of those pathogens that we're concerned about. There's a link to the CDC and more information on PPE. And then of course, I present a course twice a month on infection control. It's three and a half hours. So this is how we want to look chair side. It's not glamorous, but we have our forearms covered and the gloves should go over the elastic bands. And this is how we don't want to look chair side, right? We, the amount of aerosol so close to this uh, patient zone that is landing on your forearms. Um, again, I know you're not washing up to the shoulders. Sterilization. Um, I always get the question, instrument packets face up or face down? And to me, that's like the lowest priority here for me, but it's a good question, right? It depends on your manufacturer, but a couple things I will tell you. Most of your autoclaves came at one time with these racks. And these racks are a great idea if you're running packets and even some of your cassettes because they're gonna allow airflow between the packets or the cassettes and you can probably get more into your autoclave. You don't wanna put your packets on the lowest uh, level tier because you risk damaging your instruments, you risk staining the autoclave as well, but always follow your manufacturer's instructions. So instruments pack, packets up or down, use the racks and it's not a question anymore. 
Um, sterilization again, the problem here is that instruments that are not properly sterilized, they're a safety risk to you and your patients. And spore testing, always a question, depends on how many instruments you're running. According to CDC, it could be weekly, it could be daily. Um, it's important that your autoclaves are maintained. So they should be maintained daily, weekly, monthly, and then annually. Send them in for a tune-up. Have the manufacturer look at the gaskets, calibrate it, so forth. Protect your investment, and you certainly don't want your autoclaves to go down or to not be autoclaving or sterilizing your instruments correctly, right? We have some um, citations here for you. What happens when your autoclave fails? Um, and this one link here to the dirty dentist, um, this is really a cautionary tale, I think, for all of us. So if you have the opportunity, please listen to that video. And again, um, if you want a deeper dive, sign up for my course here. Uh, Pre-procedural rinses as we close here. The problem here is that our practices can be contaminated by pathogens, viruses, bacteria, even fungi, of course, SARS-CoV-2, due to aerosol generating procedures, right? The question is, can we reduce those levels through procedure, pre-procedural rinses? And the data of recent tells us yes, but there are some Cochrane reviews and so forth that say, ah, we still need more science behind this. But the concern, of course, hand pieces, ultrasonic scalers, contaminated water lines all lead to um, aerosol and, and contamination. So we might be able to reduce some of the pathogenic load um, emitted by our patients by having them use an antiseptic rinse. Right now, um, at early on in the pandemic, the, AD, the ADA's requirements or, or requested um, practices to use chlorhexidine and gluconate, hydrogen peroxide, or even povidone iodine. I'm gonna show you the efficacy of those against um, another technology here. And we have a course that is offered oral rinses, what's safe, what's effective by Dr. Herb Moskowitz. Here are some of his studies that he allowed me to share today on molecular iodine versus all of the above. And you can uh, take a look at the data yourself, but um, efficacy has been found to be quite great with molecular iodine compared to chlorhexidine gluconate and so forth in the presence of SARS-CoV-2 as well, in the presence of saliva. And nasal decolonization. So nasal decolonization is also important. It's been in the news lately. And um, many patients now that go in for outpatient surgery, especially joint replacement surgery and so forth, are now required to swab their nos nostrils five days before the surgery. Why? Because we know that Staph aureus and MRSA and other, other bad guys are living in the nasal passages and we have carriers. So we know that it reduces the level of these pathogens and it can be efficacious in the dental practice as well. So this was um, on topical nasal decolonization where the patient will use either a swab or a spray. In the case of hospitals, um, they use povidone iodine, some will use bacitracin and others and here we have some links for you on nasal decolonization. Um, again, from Dr. Moskowitz here, the nasal cavity is a reservoir for SARS-CoV-2, of course, and transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2 from the upper airway and decolonization of MRSA in the nasal mucosa. And this was povidone iodine versus molecular iodine. And um, you can take a look at those studies. And as we close here, hand pieces. At the end of the day, the reason why I've included hand pieces here is the number of attendees that have told me that they're using uh, cava wipes on their slow speeds or their hygiene hand pieces. And we have to be concerned about biofilm. These hand pieces will 
pull in our creative vortex in a vacuum and saliva and blood and other potentially infectious material can enter these hand pieces creating biofilm. So if you're not sterilizing these hand pieces using an autoclave, you can potentially um, infect your patient and also uh, create aerosol, which we're trying to mitigate for, right? So contaminated water lines can also contaminate our hand pieces as well. I'm sure Amanda's gonna be talking about that here shortly. Barrier protection isn't adequate for um, dental handpiece uh, sterility, okay? Follow your manufacturer's instructions for cleaning and sterilization. You should never be wiping down your hand pieces with cava wipes and counting on that to sterilize your instruments. And I've heard, well, we don't have enough hand pieces. Well, then I think you might be seeing too many patients that day, or you may need to get more hand pieces. Um, all hand pieces must be autoclaved, including the motors, dental hygiene motors, full stop, not an option. All right, and there's the science there for you. Some links, cross-infection risks associated with high-speed dental hand pieces. And with that, I'd like to bring Amanda on. And Amanda, I only went two minutes over, so. Good, I'm, I'm proud of you. Um, all right, well, we are going to rapid fire our way through this. So hopefully you can see my screen just fine. So we're doing nine and 10. So we're going to talk about water lines and suction lines. And just like you see here in this picture, they get tangled up in our heads, just like they get tangled up in our op, right? You pick up the air water syringe and this, you know, the suction falls on the ground, right? And you got to doff your PPE and oh my goodness. These two lines we're actually going to treat differently. So first we're going to talk about water. And the CDC says that our water must be under 500 colony forming units of heterotrophic bacteria. So when we test our water, which we'll talk about, that's what they say is safe water, according to the EPA, safe drinking water. That's why they picked that number. So why do our water lines get full of stuff, right? Well, they're teeny, teeny, tiny little lines. When you think about like, they're not like big pipes, you know, like we see, you know, coming into our house, but they're tiny. And because they're tiny and because the water doesn't flow through really fast, it's able to lay down biofilm. This picture that you see of those green tubes, that yellow inside, is not the yellow of an inside of the tube, that's actually biofilm. And you can see that microscopic picture of there. And so that biofilm also grows really, really fast. And so some people say, oh, I totally have a new office. I don't need to worry about this yet. But that bacteria, according to a study by Barbeau, says that the bacteria can reach up to 200,000 colony forming units in less than five days in a brand new office. Like you just had a new build. And so if you remember, I said 500 was safe water. And I don't know if you've ever sprayed water and seen like little black chunks or maybe like the picture right here in this cup where you see like maybe some strings come out, but those are biofilms. And what's in that biofilm? Much like uh, Dr. Rowling was talking about, there could be funguses, there could be all kinds of things. But the three things that we're most concerned about that have been linked to harming patients are Pseudomonas aeruginosa, non-tuberculous mycobacterium, and then the Legionella species. And those are all things that put not only our patients, but put us as clinicians at risk. Most recently, the CDC put out a health advisory alert show, telling us about the third U.S. outbreak of contaminated dental unit water lines harming children. So this happened in Georgia a year ago. Um, and, and so this is another case where children have been harmed by contaminated dental water lines. And the one number that I want you to remember um, is this 85 number. So this 85 number comes from the Anaheim outbreak, which was the second outbreak, uh, where there were 71 children harmed by contaminated water lines. This was back in 2016. But the 85 number means that the symptoms in these kids, these 71 kids, the symptoms showed up one day after treatment. So the first child, the next day after she had a pulpotomy, she started to develop an infection. And the last child that developed an infection, their infection showed up 409 days after their treatment. And the reason I harp on this number is to show you, many of us say, oh my gosh, I've been in dentistry for 25 years or 30 years. I've never killed anybody with my water lines. I've never tested them before. You know what? All we can say is that we don't know, but we do know that harmful, bio, harmful biofilms do grow and we need to take care of them. 
So not only taking care of our patient's health, we need to take care of our health. And Dr. Rowling was definitely talking about all of these aerosols, right? These aerosols we're concerned about in our operatories. Well, what we keep finding study after study after study, and I'm so excited I keep getting to add studies to this list, is that 78% of the aerosols, if they captured an aerosol in our operatory, you know, from a power scaler or air water syringe or handpiece, 78% of the makeup of those aerosols is coming directly from our procedural water. And so the amazing news is if you know that your water is safe, are you if you are testing and treating your water, you know your water is safe, you're actually not as concerned about those aerosols. I still want you to take care of them, but they're not as concerning. They're not virulent to you, the clinician. So how do we make sure we're taking care of our aerosols? We need to test, shock, treat, and maintain. So testing is the only way to know that your water lines are safe. Because you know what? You can pour water in a cup and it can look as clear as day and it can still fail. So you have to test to be able to know what are those colony forming units. So they have both in-office chairside tests and they have mail-in tests. At my office, we do a mail-in test once a year and then we do quarterly uh, chairside tests. It's a great way to make sure we're staying on top of our water line testing. So when should we test? If you've never heard about testing before, you should test at the beginning of your water line journey. See where your lines are. If you're like, Amanda, I don't even know. We've never tested. Well, let's test and see how it's going. Then if you make any changes, if you listen to this presentation tonight and you're like, you know what? We're going to change the product that we're using. I want you to go ahead and test. See how your current product is working. And then you're able to understand what you need to do to get yourself either passing or maybe you're already passing. Then I want you to test routinely. And what routinely means is first, you're going to have to look at your chair manufacturer because they might have an opinion. Some say monthly, some say quarterly, some don't say anything. If they don't say anything, follow your treatment product recommendations. If they don't say anything, let's listen to what OSAF, the Organization for Sterilization and Asepsis Prevention, the big dental infection people, let's listen to what they say. They say test monthly for two consecutive passes. So two months of two, two consecutive passes and then go to quarterly testing. So quarterly testing, once you've been passing for a little while, is a perfect way to make sure your water lines are staying safe. Test before you shock your lines though, because if you test right after a shock, you're gonna pass. We wanna know how you're doing before you shock. And then you're gonna wanna test after you fail, if you have a fail. So shocking, I just mentioned shocking. What is shocking? Shocking is using a strong high level antimicrobial to sort of blast away that biofilm. So you're gonna wanna shock at the beginning of your water line treatment. You're gonna wanna probably shock quarterly to start off with. And then you might be able to push it further but in the beginning, shocking quarterly is good. Test, then shock. And then if you have a test that reveals a contamination of more than 200 colony forming units, go ahead and shock. And I know you're like, wait, Amanda, you said 500 was safe water. Absolutely. But 200 colony forming units means the biofilm is starting to grow. So it's getting to it, you know, it's getting to that, that, that plaque before it becomes a cavity. We want to hop on it before it's a fail. Make sure you read the instructions for use for your shock product and for your treatment product. Whatever they say, use them according to those instructions. So now we're ready to treat. Treat yourself because you've tested and you've passed and you've shocked and you're ready to start your treatment program, but also treat your lines. And the reason that we want to both shock and treat is I like to say that shocking is like a perio maintenance visit. Shocking is like when this is my dad in the chair. This is when I am working hard at his perio maintenance visit. I'm in there with my guided biofilm therapy and I'm really making sure I disrupt all the biofilm, but I would never say, hey dad, I'm so good at this. You don't have to brush or floss or use your perio protect trays or your water flosser for three months because I'm, I'm, I'm just that awesome. No, I want him to do his home care. And so treating is like your everyday home care. So there's lots of treatment products on the market. Again, use them for the instructions for use, use what they say, but there's tablets, there's straws and there's liquids. All are very effective, but I also want to tell you that all of them fail. My water lines and my practice fail sometimes. And so we have to go back through that shocking process. So it happens. Biofilm is a beast, right? It's a beast in our patient's mouth. It's a beast in our water lines. And then flushing. When you get into the office every morning, I want you to flush all of your water lines for 20 to 30 seconds. And then make sure you're doing that also between every single patient. There is some retraction that happens. So we wanna make sure that we're not 
you know, spraying yucky water, the water from the patient before into the next patient's mouth. There's a couple myths that always come up when I talk about water lines. And again, this is a rapid fire way to talk about water lines. I could do this for hours. Some people often say, I'm using distilled water, so I don't need to worry about that treatment or that shocking. Not true. Distilled water is not a get out of jail free card. In fact, distilled water has a low pH and no chlorine. So you could actually have more biofilm. And your chair manufacturer might tell you not to use distilled water, or it might tell you to use distilled water. So follow those instructions for use. And then the city water comes straight into our chairs. We don't have a bottle system and we don't have a centralized system. There's no way we can do anything with our water. Well, it's time to have a sit down and figure out what you're going to implement in your practice. Are you going to retrofit your chairs with bottles? Are you going to bring in a centralized system that will treat your water? But you need to do something because the way that it's working now, there's no way to treat your water. More than likely, your lines are going to fail. Go ahead and test. See how they're doing. Lastly about water is sterile water. If you are doing any kind of surgical procedures, endo, extractions, implants, pulpotomies, anything like that, you need to be using sterile water with separate sterile tubing and or disposable syringes. Don't pour sterile water into your bottle and think that that's going to give you sterile water on the way out. The biofilm is forming in the water lines from the bottle to the air water syringe. That's where the biofilm happens. So that won't work. So make sure you're using sterile water for sterile procedures. So what do I have to do again with water? You need to shock, test, and document it. We all know we got to write that down. Choose a maintenance product and use it. Flush your lines at the beginning of the day and in between patients. Retest quarterly and document it. And then shock as needed. So that was rapid fire water. Now we're going to move on to suction. So let's hope that doesn't happen to us. So Dr. Rowling even talked about this. She talked about the zone one. We want to keep those aerosols, those droplets, that spatter. We want to keep all of that in zone one, because even if it's not virulent, we don't need all that stuff in our face and our hair, right? But we also know that things happen. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can. So how can we do that? Well, first, we need to understand the rules. And I talked about those instructions for use when I talked about our waterline products. But we also have some instructions for use when it comes to our suction. And shockingly, this is something I did not know till I went down the road to learn about suction was that our valves, you know, the turning off, off and on things that we use for our suction actually have instructions for use. You don't need to read all these words, but the point is, is that many of them tell us that we actually need to be reprocessing these valves daily, weekly, maybe in between every patient. And can you imagine finding the time to take apart all of those pieces in between every single patient? I mean, the O-rings alone would take me forever. They always get caught up in my fingers, right? But think about your suction adapter. And, and when I went to you know, research this, and I, of course, went into my office and pulled my suction adapter off, and this is what it looked like. And I got to tell you, it was stuck on with a Gorilla Glue of biofilm. It didn't twist and turn anymore because it was totally stuck with just yuck and gunk. And inside, you could see so much stuff for me. And you think about that and think, oh, my gosh, that's so close to my patient's face. Or, oh, I suck up their cheek with that. And so this is something to look at when you go back into your op, look at that valve and think, hmm, would I want that in my mouth? Pat Pine actually did this really great study in RDH Magazine where, where she went into a bunch of offices that she did compliance work with and she took an ATP meter and she actually swabbed all of the valves after clinicians had reprocessed them. So, so they'd already gone through with their wipes, right? They'd wipe, discard, wipe, or spray, wipe, spray. They turn their room over. And so she walked in with an ATP meter, which measures microbial activity. And out of the 102 surfaces that she tested, only four of them passed on the interior and none of them passed out of the 106 on the exterior. Oh my goodness. Think about it though. Think about how many nooks and crannies are in that valve. And what we're trying to, in our frenzy to you know, turn our room over, we're actually not getting them as clean as we think we are. So that's something to think about when we think about our suction. And thinking about our patient safety. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I think about suction, I can only picture this patient that's like, I need you to put the suction in my mouth because the water, I'm going to die from my toxic saliva, right? Or, or they're having that intimate moment with the uh, saliva ejector and like, hmm, do you guys need some time together? A little room, their makeout session with Mr. Thirsty? So running the lines is not enough to keep our patients safe. This picture 
says a thousand words. Look at this. On the left, you can see the debris and suction lines. It builds up over time, right? It gets so gross. And then the picture on the right is the debris left in the pipe after it has been flushed. I can't say that I'd still want to put my mouth on that, right? Think about backflow. So we know, according to the CDC, that backflow occurs when previously suctioned fluids from the patient before end up going back into the next patient's mouth. So backflow happens when that pressure in the patient's mouth, when they close their mouth, when they have that, you know, maybe we ask them to close down. I know we're really guilty of that too. It's a great way to clear the mouth fast. But we ask them to close their mouth or they close their mouth, right? And the pressure in their mouth is greater than the pressure in the vacuum and actually draws it back. It's, it, it's like drinking. Have you ever like shared your drink with a toddler and you, it's like a glass and you watch them drink through their straw and then you watch half of the food that's in their mouth come back through the straw? That's backflow. So also it happens when that suction tubing is positioned above our patient's head so gravity doesn't work for us. And backflow can also happen if we're using both the saliva ejector and the HVE at the same time and if our vacuum isn't strong enough. So those are all things to consider. But really think about it. I mean, the majority of our patients, think about just today, how many patients close their mouth on the suction and is that what you want in your mouth? Oh, I tell you, not me. You might see some of these inline backflow valves. And I still have some concerns about these. You see how far back from the actual valve they are. So they prevent backflow maybe to here, but then how really, where is much of the backflow that's gonna end up in our patient's mouth? It's probably all through there. In fact, I showed you all of those yucky valves, right? So I don't think this is quite enough. So I think it's important that we consider some sort of disposable valve system with a disposable backflow preventer. If we use a product like that, then we're able to confidently tell our patients to close their mouth, get their mouth, free of fluid, and we know that we can turn our room over quickly, and we know they haven't gotten any backflow. Also, another thing to consider is our tubing. You know, I showed you that picture in the very beginning of all the tubes, and they were all kind of different colors, right? And we know after a while, our tubing starts to get hard, or maybe it starts to crack, right? And they make some really great tubings now that are far lighter than our old tubing. And I got to tell you, from an ergonomic perspective, it's huge. I was able to change out all of the tubing in our entire practice and I did it myself and I'm not super duper handy. And it only cost our practice uh, $200. We have four ops. It was pretty easy. I want to show you this little video that I did uh, after I changed my tubing. So you can see this bendy tubing. That was the new tubing. And there's the old tubing. It was so stiff and hard. And I got to tell you, if you looked in that tubing, you could see the profi paste of 40 years totally in there. So we also want to make sure that our suction sucks, right? In fact, I teach at a dental hygiene school and we're closed tomorrow because our suction's down, right? When your suction's down, you're not working, right? So what do we have to do to make sure our suction stay healthy so that they're able to control these aerosols for us? You want to make sure that you're running suction every day. And sometimes maybe between patients, if you have a big surgical case where there's a lot of blood, I would really consider running that suction in between patients. I highly recommend using some sort of atomizer dispenser. You can see a bunch of them on here on the picture. The reason that is, is that when you hook up those valves, not only is it hands-free, which is great, because then I can go off and finish my chart notes or maybe go to the bathroom, but it also adds that fluid from the suction product and air at the same time. And that creates a vortex in the lines and it's able to clean all of the inside 360 around inside the lines, as opposed to just chugging through at the bottom. So it does a better, more effective job of trying to keep your lines clean. It's also important to look at the traps. So we have these traps, right? And they get gross and gunky. And so it's important to regularly change your traps. Think about it. So all that suction, everything that we're sucking, right? Goes first through the traps, then through your amalgam separator, if you have one, then through your vacuum pump and then out. So it's a lot of places to go. And if there's clogging anywhere, you're not going to have as effective of a vacuum as a suction as you need. These were actually the suction traps in my operatory. Um, clearly, we weren't doing very good on our SOPs, changing them. And shockingly, our suction wasn't working very well. Not surprising, right? Or have you ever gone in to change your suction traps and you see this gray slurry, just grossness, right? This is actually amalgam mixed with just extra sludge um, that is sitting in your trap. 
if you are changing traps um, and, and you are taking amalgam out, those traps actually need to go in a whole separate biohazard special container um, because they have mercury in them. They can't go in your regular trash and they can't even go in your hazardous waste. They actually have to go in a whole nother trash. So speaking of your amalgam separator, I don't know about you guys, but when that amalgam separator got put in, I really felt a difference in our suction. Um, and it tends to get filled with profi paste. Here's a little hack for you. You can get a little UV light and put it on the side of your amalgam separator to see how full it is. That way you know when to change out that trap. They say once a year, ours got filled in like six months and we had to change it. Also, you might have a big trap in your suction. So make sure you're checking that one too. Again, when our suction wasn't working well, ours was totally filled and clogged up. And so you need to have that really good, good, clear path for all that suction to go so that your A, your vacuum doesn't break down, but B, you have the best way to control aerosols for your patients and control fluid. So what do you have to do again with suction? We want to set up an SOP. You want a standard operating procedure, right? You want daily suction cleaning from the back to the front with some kind of dispenser and a safe cleaner. Change your traps once a week, empty your vacuum, the big trap, once a month, and check on that amalgam separator if you have one. Also, check your suction adapter instructions for use. Make sure that, what do they say? Are they telling you to reprocess between every patient? Use your HVE. We didn't talk about that much this time because I'm going rapid fire, but really that's the best way for us to control aerosols is using HVE. And then lastly, make sure you have some sort of effective backflow preventer to keep your patients safe. And so I made it through and we still have time for questions, Dr. Raleigh. I'm so proud of myself because um, that was a little rapid fire. Um, no, it was excellent. Excellent. And we do have some questions here. And um, let's start at the top here. All right. Have there been studies um, on refillable hand sanitizer dispensers too? Can the hand sanitizer also be contaminated? Absolutely. So um, if you're topping those off, Etc. they can also be contaminated. So you want to use a touchless system, if at all possible. Uh, Wendy wants to know, should we shower after every patient? You know, when I get a question like that, I laugh, but I, I go back to what my mother used to tell me growing up when I didn't want to take the medicine or so forth. And, and I'm from the era where we weren't vaccinated for measles. We actually had measles. And she used to say, you haven't been that sick yet. So that's how I answer that question. You haven't been that sick, Wendy. When you've been that sick, you're going to shower after every patient. Um, are there any instrument packets that can be reused? I know that they sell some reusable, um, but I haven't used them. So there are some that were sort of a, a cloth type reusable Um you can look into those, but I have no knowledge of their efficacy. Anything you want to say, Amanda? Um, I, I have heard of them. I haven't used them. I would say, though, if you're using them, you must ensure that you are using a chemical indicator right. um, in those pouches to show, because it won't have the natural paper color change like we're used to with a normal patch. So you'd have to buy a separate chemical indicator. And they'd have to be on the outside, too, because I don't think you can see through those pouches. Yeah. Um, Tammy makes the um, comment. If saliva was red, a great video. Yes. yes. I like the first one too. I like the music. It's kind of funky. Um, uh, Nishal makes the comment here. They use gowns laundered by Cintos. The arms are long. And sometimes I notice my wrist is exposed between my gloves and the cuff of the gown. Do you have any suggestions to bridge this gap? There are some gowns that have um, extra long arms too. You may want to look into those. I don't know if they're um, anything that Cintas offers. That's really the best I can do. And then there are some gloves that have longer cuffs and maybe that would help as well. I, I have a good hack. That happens to mine. And so I actually went to the dollar store and I bought a bunch of really cheap Richard Simmons-esque sweatbands. <laughs> That's about? a great idea. I yeah. And I have sweatbands. In fact, I wear one over my Apple watch because I still want to wear my watch, oh, yeah. but I don't want my watch to get contaminated. So right. I wear those sweatbands and I wash them like I wash my PPE. Perfect. I love it. Um, let's see. We've got a comment from Tammy, I think. There was an office that they worked at. They were new at the time. Went to take the handpiece off. It was basically calcified onto the line. 
because the previous hygienist never took it off for the six years they were there. Gross had to call Henry Schein to come and cut the entire line and change that line out. Um, and they were mortified. Yeah, I'm mortified and I've seen that kind of thing, which is why we're all here tonight. And thanks for sharing that. And that happens, that happens with the suction valves too. If you yeah. go into your office, you might have to cut the line. Yep. Um, let's see, Monica states they do an office monthly test tw twice a year, send it to the lab. Terrific. Donna does the studies, reveal what procedures that were performed on the patients that became sick. Um, I think we're talking about the waterline incident in Anaheim and so well, forth. Those I, were all pulpotomies. Yeah. All she, of those cases were pulpotomies. And they ended up with alveolar infection. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lymphadenopathy. Um, pulmonary nodules. It was it was severe infections. We're not just talking, you know, some antibiotic. And know. in children, those infections can go to life threatening very quickly. Oh yes. So, um, Tammy, I cringe when people close and suck on the saliva ejector. I pull it out of their mouth, um, and they say I wasn't done spitting. I know. Um, and then I'm reading this. We clean the lines, but not clean enough. Okay. During the start of COVID in 2020, this is Jerry, I purchased and used an electrolyzed water generator, Ecolux Tech, to make hypochlorous acid for use in the Fogger electrostatic sprayer. I checked and confirmed the pH after making it as recommended. Is this still considered an adequate way to make hypochlorous acid, or do I need to switch to an approved pre-made version from a company like Everclean? So Jerry, one thing you need to do is check with Ecolex and see what your concentration of hypochlorous acid is. So that's important for you to be able to kill C. diff spores. So find out from them if you are generating a concentration that is going to kill C. difficile spores. And if they tell you yes, ask how long that surface needs to remain wet for that to occur. If they tell you 20 minutes, Obviously, that's not going to work well for your dental practice, right? But you do want a pH that is as neutral as possible. Now, not all hypochlorous acid is approved with electrostatic sprayers either. So check again with your manufacturer. Um, the NADCC tablets, Everclean, which is a company that I work with, are easy. Um, but you have to use four to the container, the electrostatic sprayer, the Protexas. And that's a concentration of 4,306 parts per million. And many of these um, countertop generators, the concentration is around 200. So, um, and sometimes some of these generators are the same generators that are used in grocery stores for your produce, for foodborne. So make sure that you understand, you know, what your concentration is. And that's a great question, all great questions. Um, do you recommend autoclaving the suction adapters? This is from Brittany. So I would check your instructions for use, but it, it very well might tell you to autoclave those, uh, those adapters. Um, so we'll talk about more of that once we get to the, the next portion, but, um, but that is definitely something that I, uh, if you were using those, I would consider. Okay. You will get the handouts uh, coming up here shortly. And we've got some questions that we're gonna just hightail it through here. There's some duplicates here. Okay, here we go, Amanda. Question about um, when did closing on the saliva ejector start? I don't recall, it was the norm in the 1980s. I don't either, Donna. I don't know when the transition happened but uh, somebody came up with it. We're gonna have to hunt them down, Amanda. Well, it's a great way to remove the fluid from the mouth quickly. It like works. You do that and, it's, and, it, and it works. So if you have a disposable backflow preventer, you can actually do it and not worry about it. Um, so it's a nice way to still make it happen quickly and keep patients safe. Let's see, uh, asking offices are still doing amalgams. I thought that was old news. Removing amalgams is not, if you're ever in a public health exactly. clinic, that's what you're doing all the time. Yeah, and we're still um, removing amalgams in our practice. Um, yeah. Yeah, because you're, you're still replacing amalgams. So any anytime you're dealing with amalgam, placing it or removing it, that's when we're talking about, you know, that that's why you have that um, 
That's why we have all those rules around amalgams. From Monica, do you recommend changing the suction adapter between patients? So that's a lot, Monica. Um, I got to tell you, but it's going to depend on your instructions for use. I will tell you that VA offices, you know, federally qualified health centers, which are often the best of infection control, they're the ones following all the rules. If their instructions for use are telling them to do that, they are indeed doing that. Or they're using it, that disposable valve that I showed you that picture of. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But so there's a great, easy way to get around that um, coming up. Question from Jennifer, how much bleach and a small load of laundry for lab coat and scrubs? So if your scrubs are white, then you can use bleach, right? If your scrubs aren't white, you, the bleach is going to fade them out. So um, the concentration that's recommended is one parts to nine parts water. So one part bleach to nine parts. In your washing machine, converting that is something else. So you're going to have to find out how many gallons that run through that system. Um, I can tell you I'm someone that bleaches everything now, and I run about a half a cup to um, a medium load of laundry. So that's something, again, to consider um, looking at how many gallons you have. All right. Um, let's see. Um, so if we're laundering our own scrubs at home, is that permitted? In some states it is. Yep. I thought either offices need to provide disposable gowns or have a washing machine on premises or sent out. Depends on what state you're in and where you're working. In public health clinics, it's sticks and stones dentistry and you wear your own. Um, we, <laughs> what's the type of material of the lighter and newer hoses, Amanda? You know, I don't know what the material is, but darn it, it is it is way lighter. Um, and, and most of the manufacturers have them now, Benko and Patterson. And um, the initial one that I used was by um, Aflex, A-F-L-E-X-X tubing. Um, and it is significantly lighter. I will tell you, though, it's not going to last 30 years or 40 years like your old tubing did. But should your tubing last that long? Yeah. You know, when you go in and you see the old corrugated ones, those are of concern too, because those corrugated ones, um, you've got so much surface area that's contaminated. You're never going to be able to flush it out. Oh, yeah. Get rid of it. Get rid of the corrugated. Now, some of the corrugated will have the smooth interior, but they're not all that flexible either. Um, yes, please consider your offices. We're going to talk about Dove Dental Capdol HVE adapters. Um Monica, the soap dispenser, they do have an antimicrobial soap. And I think there's a question here from Dr. Stanley. Hi, Dr. Stanley. I've heard KN95 masks are not sufficient. What do you recommend? Well, if you're dealing with ultra fine, ultra fine particles, even your N95 mask might not be sufficient, which is why you want to make sure that you're addressing the zones. Um, and look at the resource sheet that we've provided as well. Um, I was in a hospital wearing a KN95 for an overnight stay um, for observation for vertigo. I have Meniere's about uh, Labor Day weekend. And three days later, I became infected with COVID. So um, I was exposed to someone I'm pretty sure in the room with me who was coughing all night long. And I wore a KN95 all night. So, and the sheet over my head, okay? And I still got COVID. Um, and that's anecdotal, but uh, yes, take a look at that. All right, all, we are going to um, direct you now to hopefully stay on and watch a promo webinar here with Amanda. And she's going to talk to you about some solutions for your amalgam as well as the disposable valve um, adapters so that you don't have to worry to try to clean out all those nitty gritties and you know you're gonna be safe every time. Um, Amanda, let's go ahead and bring up your presentation. And I wanna thank everybody for being here and please stay on with us. Okay, am I sharing my screen? Yes. Okay, great, just making sure. Yep. All right.
So everybody, this is talking about Dove dental products. So Dove solves four problems. One is that amalgam separator question, which I'm so glad some of you are asking questions about. So please, please, please listen, because I got to tell you, this is genius. And the next one is backflow. You know, I, th I think I probably grossed you out enough about the backflow. And then aerosols, and then about that compliance, because I tell you, compliance can slow us down, right? But we want to do what's right. So let's first talk about our amalgam separator. So we had to bring these things in. This was part of, you know, the, the EPA rule was to try to keep amalgam out of our water lines, right? So we brought in these amalgam separators into practices. But what we quickly found out, and this is per the EPA, that 68 to 78 percent of that amalgam is actually captured in our chairside traps. You saw that picture when I spoke earlier, that sludge, right? I think we've all seen that sludge. And I also worry that we don't pay enough respect to the mercury. And in fact, when Dr. Raleigh and I were first getting to know one another, we talked about how when, when we were younger, you know, early on dental assistants, mixing that amalgam, you know, by hand. And now we know like, oh my goodness, what were we doing? But think about going and changing out that amalgam separator. And, and we probably should almost be in hazmat suits, right? Because think about what we are inhaling, what we are exposing our bodies to. And so there's a great alternative to that clunky amalgam separator that slows down your vacuum, that adds another thing, you know, another trap that you have to check and, and another thing you have to do. And that is Captol. What Captol is, is it is a, a suction device with a built-in amalgam separator that you just pop on your HVE and it captures the amalgam right at the source, the patient's mouth. So when you are removing, when your doc or your, you doc are removing that amalgam, you are actually capturing that amalgam directly into that device. It's not even going into your traps. It's not even going into your suction system. And then it's not even going downstream into our water system. As soon as you finish with that patient, you're done with the procedure. All you have to do is a pop it off and you throw it in the prepaid package. Uh, and then once that's full, you mail it off. It's that simple. This is an amazing product that really helps you eliminate one whole thing from your to-do list. And don't we all need one thing eliminated from our to-do list? I don't know about you, but I do. So we talked about also that patient safety, that backflow, right? All of you are totally grossed out. And we all know those patients that have that huge makeout session with the suction but we also wanna control that fluid fast. I want that fluid out of my way because I only have so much time with my patient. But when we look at those valves, and, and I want you to go back into your operatory tomorrow or whenever you work next, next and look at your valve, take it apart. They are gross. These are pictures of some valves. This was 2011 and these pictures were taken only three years later. And these valves were vacuum lines were flushed once a week, we talked about every day. These are flushed once a week and look how gross they are. And we think about that backflow. We think about our patients getting that back in their mouth. So the VA did a great study because we talked a little bit about, you know, who is, who is following the rules, who is definitely autoclaving these valves, right? Who wants to? So the VA did a study and what the VA found was that it takes 11 minutes of time for someone to reprocess one of these valves, 11 minutes. I don't have 11 minutes. Do you have 11 minutes? And so what a great alternative to having to do all of those steps is to consider a disposable valve. Not only then do you not have to worry about reprocessing the valve, but you have the bonus of a built-in backflow preventer. So your patients can close their mouth. If you suck up their cheek, you don't have to worry about it. And so it takes a lot of that concern out of it um, and, and a whole nother thing to save time. And we all know when it comes to infection control that I think our patients are far more aware than they've ever been. Dr. Rowling talked about it. She talked about how our patients watch like, oh, is the doctor washing their hands? You know, oh, what kind of, you know, barriers are in place? What's happening? You know, we're opening our packages in front of our patients. These are all important things to show our patients that we are doing all we can to keep them safe. And I think COVID really woke their eyes up. And so a great way to show patients that we are doing all they can, all we can to keep them safe is to consider using these disposable one-time use only products. And when you have these products, I encourage you to educate and retain. We're educating our patients about all we do for them. I want
want you to show your patients your waterline tests. I want that to be on your social media. I want you to let your patients know that, you know, this is a one-time use only thing and it has a backflow preventer and it's safe for you to close your mouth. Let's teach our patients these things. We And we want to retain our team. Oh my gosh, that staffing crisis that's going on right now is more concerning than ever. And if we have the products in our operatory and we're, we know as employees and we know as clinicians that we're doing all we can to keep ourselves and our patients safe, you have a much happier environment. I got to tell you, I've worked in offices where I haven't been happy with the infection control and I haven't lasted very long. So these are things that really help me as a clinician feel good about the care I give. So what are some of those options that you have with the Dove Dental products? So they have some HVE valves. They have a short one or a long one. So it's great, kind of whatever you prefer. I prefer the short. Um, and then my assistant, she prefers the long. Um, this one is hands down my absolute favorite HVE because I'm trying much harder to use HVE now, right? This has a 22 millimeter wide opening and the most amazing flare where it has really great retraction. And then you can see these three triangles right there. And what they do is not only are you capturing aerosols there, but you're capturing aerosols there and super big bonus. So you can see that this is beveled, but you're not gonna suck up the patient's cheek because it won't allow you to do that whole, you know, tongue suck thing, right? It has a built-in backflow preventer. Uh, so you don't even have to worry about this. This one is my absolute favorite. Now, my co-hygienist, Erica, this is her favorite. She still loves a saliva ejector, but she really wants to incorporate HVE, but she's struggling. This uh, connects to your HVE, but you can see here that it has right here some holes and it actually collects aerosols right there. So you have that HVE capacity. And in fact, here is a little video of it in action. You can see it sucking up the aerosols. Do you see how they go right up there? So it's that one's a really great choice. Now, if we're still just looking at saliva ejectors, you know, often we're just controlling that fluid. This is where our patients have their extra makeout session, right? You can get a dub adapter with or without the actual saliva ejector, which is really handy. Um, and so you can choose kind of which one you want. So a great question, what can a dental office do to make it safer for patients that's not being done today? Is something that when patients are made aware of the potential danger of backflow, of amalgam, right? It's, they'll greatly appreciate, they'll value the remedy and the remedy is believable and visible and would be a nominal cost to the dentist, $1.50 to $2 a patient. The answer is just, just dub disposable evacuation valves. Truly, this is a great solution to be able to solve that issue of having to reprocess valves, having to deal with backflow, and then also having to deal with that amalgam separator. So why dove? You can ditch that amalgam separator. You don't even have to worry about it. Then you're only pulling out that cap doll when you're doing amalgam generating procedures. And you'll find, oh my goodness, you'll find that having that one less thing to do is great. You're controlling aerosols. Dr. Rowling talks so much about these aerosols, right? We want to make sure we're controlling them. If we're able to do that with an effective device that's safe for our patients, that's following those instructions for use for that valve, but we're able to control those aerosols and keep our patients safe. And then backflow. Our patients can close their mouth again happily. We can get that fluid out of the way and control that field and be able to do our job, but not worry about our patients having to experience any backflow. So tell your patients, teach your patients to look for that blue valve. There's a picture of Bob there pointing to the blue valves. And really what's that saying is let your patients know that when they go to your office, hey, we have these new valves and this is why we're doing this for you. And it's a huge value add when patients understand all you're doing to take care of them. Infection control takes time and money. So using that to let your patients know is a big deal. We should do that. So these are all the products that you can see kind of all in one line that are available from Dove. Um, again, I mentioned this is my favorite. This is the one that I use for HVE. And then Erica, that's the one that she uses. Um, so there's lots of options there um, for you guys, whatever works the best for you. Amanda, I want to remind everybody that um, Dove is offering free samples. All you need to do is tap on the banner at the top of the screen. It's going to take you to their contact page. This is a great opportunity 
to uh, feel them in your hands, try them out on your patients, right? So it's a great, great opportunity for you all. Tap on the blue banner. And uh, Donna, please refer to the instructions. I've just sent them to you for CE. If you don't have them, look in the chat area. Um, also, there is a link. We've included Amanda's presentation in your course folder. And on the last page, we've added two links for you, a link to be able to access information about CapDoll. And the other link is to the free samples. So if you um, did not get that handout, hopefully you did, because that's how you'll need to get your CE credit. I'm going to repost that here. Jake, go ahead and repost it for me. So again, tap on the banner at the top of the screen to request your free samples. And um, let's look at some questions here, Amanda. Okay. Lots of thank yous here. Um, we have someone that uses Capdoll in the practice, totally satisfied, better suction, and you can get that smelly. And I'm not sure what the smelly part was, but I think we could add add to that. Absolutely. I will tell you back in the day when I was talking to Amanda um, in 1981, the way I cleaned traps and amalgam and so forth was with my bare hands and an old zinc phosphate spatula. And it smelled like death. Yeah. Those traps were filled to the top with coagulated old blood and pieces of amalgam and crowns and we had to sift through it because the dentist sent the amalgams and the crowns off to, uh, you know, a metal, metal uh, guy to get some money back for that, and it was really quite disgusting. And all without um, gloves, I'm sure. It was all without gloves. Yeah, it was all without gloves. Yeah. Somebody said they thought about this idea for years and wish they would have thought about it. Oh. But, um, also, you can bookmark that link at the top of the page if you want to take that information back to your practices tomorrow as well. Just a lot of thank yous here, Amanda. Any questions for Amanda? And please refer to the instructions. The course folder includes CE credit instructions. So if you're looking for CE credit, um, you can go ahead and log out and you'll be taken to the quiz. We'll have a lot of folks that want to try the valves. Great. I think you guys will love them. Um, they're, I'll they're tell you, this is my biggest concern right now. And this was one of the reasons why I sought out Dove Dental was this and Amalgam. But I knew that this is one of our concerns. How should I put it here? This is one of the um, hiccups in dental infection control. Yeah. We're doing everything else and you pull off that saliva ejector and you look at it and it's disgusting. It right? really is. It yeah. really is. And I don't want that in my mouth, especially since I had C. diff. Not that it would have anything to do with it, but now I'm concerned. Right yeah. now I'm, I'm looking at everything. So and, and um, I have to say, I, I know I made that, I made that pic, you know, I took that picture of changing out that amalgam separator, but I don't think we think enough about what, what we're doing when we're exposing ourselves to that, to changing that, that filter. No. And so Capdol solves that. Capdol right. takes that risk out. Um, that's just a whole nother thing. Well, and I was thinking too, um, you know, in public health clinics, I see there's a few of you in FQHCs. And um, when I was practicing in FQHCs, I was primarily a pediatrics, but I also treated um, pregnant women. And when you're removing amalgam from a pregnant woman, you want to use everything you, you know, possibly can. Um, so vapor and everything else. I mean, when you're using amalgam anyways, you should be. But in the public health clinics, that was always my concern as well. Um, how do you block off suction when you take the blue valve off? 
Oh, we we would just we had a little stopper. Um, actually, I have one of my one of my um, friends. They put a little cotton roll in theirs, um, but they do make little stoppers, little suction stoppers that you can put right at the top. Does the EPA amalgam law require you to recycle chair side traps? That's yes, it does. Okay. And this and Capdol meets all the EPA requirements for an amalgam separator. By the way. And that's important. We have a lot of things we need to keep uh, track of. And so they're keeping track of it very well for you. Very formative class, thank you. Um, here's one, my doc used dry shield. Is there an amalgam section for that? Mm, I don't think there would be a way to connect it to dry shield. I can't think how that would work. Okay, I'm going to repost also the link for Capdoll. And again, you have it in your handout. Um, so reach out to Dove Dundle as well and learn more about Capdoll. And it's right here. And I'm going to um, see if there are any more questions, anything you want to say in closing here, Amanda. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. It's been great. Yes, we have to do it again. Yes. Um, and again, if any of you have other ideas for this course, please send them to either Amanda and I, and we'll, again, it might be the 15 top ones, or um, we may expand on something else. Refer to the resources that we have in the handout for you. Please reach out to Dove Dental because again, their products are um, ahead of the game. And that's why we reached out to them because I knew those valves are so important to what you're doing in your dental practices right now, as well as the amalgam capital. Thank you so much for being here, Amanda. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us. And I guess we're gonna go ahead and close out now. We'll redirect you all to complete the quiz. And I wanna thank Dove Dental again for supporting our class this evening. Um, you have one more chance here to tap on the banner at the top of the screen and get your free uh, dove valves to try in your practice and you can bookmark that link to your device and take it to your practice tomorrow. Thanks everyone for being here this evening and we hope to have you return really soon. Bye now.